Okay, here we go. Nice and quiet. Sound speeds, camera rolling. Holding for sound. Last looks. Calling for last looks. And set and action. I need to swap batteries. You know, making movies is hard. Making movies is hard. Welcome to Making Movies is Hard, the podcast about the struggle of being an independent filmmaker. I am Ulrich Bissell, the founding host of the podcast. I've been crewing up on sets for over 10 years. I've made dozens of films, shorts and features as either a producer or a director or a sound person. And I'm just finishing up my first feature film as a writer-director called The Alternate, premiering at Dances with Films Film Festival on September 11th at midnight. So be there or be square. Um, I'm Liz Manichel. I'm a writer, director, producer. I have written, directed, and produced two features uh, called Speed of Life and Bread and Butter, Speed and Life on Showtime. <laughs> um, I am a former film critic and a current distribution consultant who also does sales for indie films. And um, I used to manage Sundance Institute's Creative Distribution Initiative. This week, we have filmmaker Nicholas Bruckman on the show to talk about uh, his film, Not Going Quietly which is the story of activist Adi Barkin, who was diagnosed with ALS at the age of 32. Uh, after the interview, we have a little bit of a conversation about Constellation Incubator, which is the incubator I just co-ran with Naomi McDougall-Jones at Beanie Bloodworth and Angela Harmon. Uh, and we presented our solution to the world about how to solve indie film. And we also answer a listener question. But without further googly gops, here is my talk because I took it so low. So this is the Liz Show. Here's my talk with Nicholas Brooklyn. Um, thank you for being on the show. Sorry, Oliver could not make it. Um, we have a few questions for you at the top about not going quietly. So the first question is for those who don't have any context for the movie, which is just shameful, but there may be some who do not. And can you give us the elevator pitch? Yes, Not Going Quietly is the story of Adi Barkin, who is a young father and activist who rises to national prominence when he confronts powerful senator on an airplane over his health care. And the video of this confrontation goes viral and launches him to a national cross-country movement fighting for health care. And he does all of this from a wheelchair as he's losing his voice because he has ALS. And as he loses his voice, he gains this national platform and becomes the most powerful activist in America, according to Politico magazine. And so that journey is documented in the film um, and contrasts how ALS robs him of his voice, but activism and social change give him a cause and a platform that allows him not only to restore his faith in democracy, but in himself and his family. Beautiful. Uh, how many days did you shoot? We shot probably total about 110 days, I would say, over the course of um, two years. Great. Uh, often people cannot speak about this, but I we ask regardless, uh, talk about the budget or share whatever you can about the film's budget. Yeah, definitely. The film budget was raised um, through a mix of um, equity and grants um, and also from some funding from my production company, People's TV, which launched the film. Um, and so we had um, some some investor support from the Duplass Brothers, um, Duplass Brothers Productions. And then we had a number of great grant supporters, including the IDA, uh, Rooftop Films, IFP, HBO grant, um, and um, a couple of sort of high net worth individuals who gave some donations through our um, fiscal sponsor at Film Independent. Um, and, um, you know, it was really a, a, a challenging fundraise as, as it has been on every independent film I've worked on. Um, Adi's prominence didn't uh, necessarily open everybody's coffers, but um, a lot of people came through and, and supported the film and really believed in it. Um, and that made it possible. Um, and on the distribution side, we are, uh, we've sold uh, most of the rights to the film. In the US, it, it's been acquired for um, non-broadcast by Greenwich Entertainment, who's releasing the film this coming Friday, August 13th in New York and LA, and then uh, subsequently around the country. And then um, in um, subsequent to that, it's going to be um, released on PBS POV in January, which we're really excited about. I've always wanted to have a film 
show on that series um, and the international rights have been acquired by Vice Media who will release it internationally. So all of that came together and, and got us kind of close to um, she's bringing the project together. And um, with regard to the actual budget, which I, I know you may not want to share, but could you say whether it's under over a million or do you feel that that's in, in yeah, a decent question? No, I don't, I don't mind. Yeah, it's under a million. Um, it was sort of mid, mid six figures, um, depending on how we kind of um, continue with the, the costs that we still have. That's one of the things that I think is sometimes uh, not always factored for is as you go forward with this kind of a um, feature, even when your project ends uh, and you've wrapped, there's just so much ongoing marketing and accounting and admin and delivery and stuff that just kind of extends forever. Um, so we'll see where we where we end up, but that's kind of the you know the ballpark of it. Um, and uh, I'm not uh, super cagey about it. I just think that um, you know when I, I I prefer to kind of have more in depth conversations that are sort of meaningful with filmmakers. Um, not that a podcast format isn't, but there's so much information that can come around that that I think is helpful um, that if filmmakers want to reach out to me directly, I'm really happy to workshop with them and their budgets and stuff like that. Um, That's amazing. And I think the reason, you know, the best practice around not sharing exact budget numbers is I think it can provide like a false comparison or the other issue is that, um, you know, when it comes to distributors and rights, they might peg what they think your film is worth to your budget. And so being that some rights are still available for us, like SPOD, you know, we um, tend not to always, um, you know, be super public about that. And I think that's what the industry best practice is, um, but happy to share with filmmakers individually. Great. Uh, how did you come up with the idea of making this movie in the first place? Well, I met Adi in early 2018 and um, I was just really taken by him and um, he didn't have long to speak. So um, I was filming him, not for a film, but for a short form video. I got connected to him by Liz Jaff, who's the political strategist in the film, who amazingly meets him on this plane and then ends up being his kind of partner in crime through his whole incredible rise. And she got in touch with me because they wanted to make a short promo film, which is something that we do at our company in addition to long form documentaries. And so, um, I flew out to Santa Barbara and I met him and he um, was really just the funniest person I kind of ever met. And it was this incredible kind of connection that I had to him. And I, you know, saw a bit of a spark of where this thing might go. So I had this kind of unusual circumstance, which you don't always have in documentary where you need months or years or whatever to build access and trust and kind of like move in. We didn't really have that luxury because he was already losing his voice. He'd been diagnosed for a year when I met him. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, as you can see in the film, a very rapid progression. So we had to move very quickly and I kind of pitched him that first night on the idea. And he said in his last Q and A with me that, um, he thought long and hard about it and discussed with his wife and decided that what was really important was for him to be rich and famous and that this documentary might help that. Um, but really I think he, he did it because, um, you know, he wanted to have a time capsule for this time in his life and for his children. And how long did you spend working on the film from that first meeting to to now? Yeah, well, that was early 2018 and um, it premiered at the South by Southwest Film Festival in March. Uh, so that was a three year journey from um, shoot to from kind of first encounter to premiere. And it um, was slowed down a bit by COVID. We had some, you know, a bunch of stuff that we had to work out around that and, and get the film finished remotely, which uh, as a lot of filmmakers have been dealing with as a challenge. And um, yeah, we'll still be on this journey for a couple more months promoting it. So it's not really over yet. Um, we're really just gearing up into this kind of distribution phase. Greenwich has been an amazing partner, but with these kinds of projects, you have so much of the network yourself and Adi does. So we're really just trying to engage everybody in his community and followers um, to spread the word about the film. Um, compared to all your other projects, what would you rate this in terms of difficulty? <laughs> yeah. Um, a nine. <laughs> um, it's an interesting question. You're right. I haven't gotten that before. So that was. Oh, uh, good. <laughs> before. Um, yeah, it was tough emotionally to work with Adi um, and do a film about somebody going through something really difficult. Of course, I hope that the 
you know, the movie is fun and, and Adi is really um, uh, amazing to be around and just makes, uh, makes you think in positive ways about what you're going to do with the time you have left and how to, so in that sense, it was a very cathartic project to make and, 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 and very healing to be with him in that way. Um, but it doesn't, you know, it doesn't take away from the realities of this disease, which you see in the film. Um, and so, um, it was hard and it was hard to get, despite him being, becoming kind of a public figure, it was still hard to raise the budget. Um, you know, a lot of the support we got only kind of amounted to about half of what we needed. So, um, my, my, our kind of commercial side of the business had to help support and, and, and kick in to keep the engines of the film running. And, um, COVID was a, was a real bummer where the movie was actually supposed to premiere at Tribeca 2020. And that got thrown out the window about three weeks before Adi was all set to fly out to New York and that um, fell apart in, you know, expected and unexpected ways. Um, and um, it ended up being for the best because we actually ended up working on the film and extending the story throughout 2020. Mm -hmm. And then we had the really, really wonderful reception of South by 2021 where it won the audience award and a special jury prize. Um, and then we got to show it in person at Tribeca 21 in uh, last month or two months ago. And um, Rachel Adi's wife and the other characters in the film came out and we had a special message from Adi. So um, yeah, things worked out in the end, but there was just a huge emotional roller coaster um, kind of at every phase about what this film would be and how we would put it together and whether anybody would ever see it. So it's great that it's coming out now, but those challenges don't mitigate. You know, we're opening, I don't know when this podcast will air, but it's opening in theaters on Friday. And of course we're still dealing with a lot of questions around the theatrical market. Um, so um, we're not out of the woods by any means yet, but I think the film is actually more timely even than it would have been last year. A lot of the film as folks will see is about winning, winning elections and then holding politicians accountable. And that's a big part of um, what we need to do now um, as kind of activists and engaged members now that the Trump administration is uh, behind us. So. I think it, um, you know, and now there's a real chance um, and Adi continues to do amazing work in support of Medicare for all um, and this idea of getting um, uh, universal um, health care access to all Americans. I think it's the moment to fight for it and I hope the movie can be part of that conversation. Um, when we originally spoke, I mean, over a year ago, um, I think it was like probably spring of 2020 that we talked i'm i'm trying i left my job a little bit after that so i'm trying to figure out the math of it all um the, it was important to you and the film team and i hope this isn't um me uh not not being proprietary or something but um uh to get the film out before the election and um obviously things changed and you got to recut the film and you got to document uh, the transition of leadership, you know, in the country. I'm just curious in terms of like filmmakers, a lot of filmmakers in the impact world have that goal, right? To be a part of um, a drive to push for policy and push for candidates. And when you had to pivot, it sounds like you got the benefit of documenting a lot more. Yeah. Could you talk a little bit about that pivot? Yeah, I mean, it was really sudden and drastic. And I think a lot of us were, um, you know, really um, struggling with um, how to how to respond to that situation. A lot of filmmakers were, and of course, the whole world. Um, we at first thought about kind of muscling through and continue and showing the film in that time frame, but we knew there was more work to do. We knew Adi's work would be affected by COVID, which we wanted to kind of carry through to the end of the film. And I think we also, um, yeah, one more time to work on it. Um, and we knew that we needed a real platform to show the film at. And after Tribeca, there was a kind of a dearth in, in festival openings that made sense for the movie. Um, you know, you can't just release in a vacuum. You really need kind of industry support to do that. And so um, we didn't see really the right window to do it before the election, um, not in a meaningful way where it would have a large and wide audience. Um, and also I had a kind of um, philosophical change of heart about how important that was in the first place. Um, obviously, 
um, you know, if we could have gotten whatever 30,000 votes in Wisconsin uh, out of this movie and, and flip the election or whatever, that would matter. But I think the movie is about much more than any one election. It's certainly not about Donald Trump. Um, and I think the movie coming out now in a much more hopeful time, so to speak, than, than um, the pre-election time frame last year where we were dealing with, with COVID and the sort of um, potential autocracy um, of, uh, that the country was going to fall under um, would have been a very difficult market to release in. Um, it continues to be, but I think it's much more receptive mm -hmm. and I think it's, much, it's a time where people can engage much more with what the film asks of you than we could have then. Um, so it wasn't entirely our decision. It was the forces of the marketplace and festivals, et cetera. Um, and we kind of got finished with our cut um, towards the end of the um, uh, 2020 cycle um, when Adi meets Joe Biden, uh, as you see at the end of the film, and, um, and the personal developments that happened in his life. And that felt like a very natural ending. And then when we got the invitation from South by Southwest, that kind of let us know, all right, we're done. <laughs> Sometimes other people tell you when you're done. Yeah. Um, I mean, from the outside, it sounds like the stakes were very high for you in making the film. I mean, you're documenting a subject who's, as you said, losing their voice, losing mobility, going through major personal triumphs and tribulations. Um, did you feel like a like I'm, <laughs> I'm sure you've been asked this question. Did you see it feel like um, just like an unearthly amount of pressure while making this film? And do you still feel that way? Yeah, I think with Adi, um, I really wanted to get it right. You know, he's I, I consider him a close friend now. He put a lot of trust in me to get this thing done. And um, and somebody needed to tell the story right. <laughs> And, and because those that fell into my lap, I think from a mix of like foresight on my part and, and, and luck and serendipity as, as were many elements of this story, I certainly felt a responsibility to, um, you know, do him justice, not just as like a great activist, but as a sort of human being, which I hope comes through in the film. And so I did, and I felt a lot of responsibility to his kids and posterity. I, I you know, I hope that Adi will be um, around for a long time and, and um, it's always unknown with ALS um, what the prognosis is. He's still doing amazing work and he's coming out to our LA premiere this coming Thursday, which is gonna be amazing um, to have him see it on the big screen um, and a really big milestone for me in terms of what I was hoping to achieve, which was to get him a standing ovation in a <laughs> crowded theater. So we'll, I don't know how crowded it'll be, hopefully not too crowded, um, probably masks on. So, um, so yeah, there was a lot of pressure to do it right. And, um, you know, I think um, it wasn't just me, it was um, a really strong team behind this project. Um, Amanda, the producer, our editor, Kent, we had four DPs that kind of cycled through because of the long duration and, and schedule of this project. Um, our, our composer, we had to switch composers halfway through the edit, you know, all kinds of shenanigans went on behind the scenes and pivots like you described earlier. Um, so, you know, I was really lucky to have um, some great support on this project. And documenting, like, I'm just trying to think of like the very practical concerns and pivots that you probably had to go through. Like as a documentarian, obviously you have to be nimble, but did you, uh, did you work a production schedule around Adi or did you, um, did you have to buy or rent specific equipment that was more mobile than you normally work in? Or like, how did the actual storytelling impact physical production? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it was pretty crazy. There was definitely a lot of different kinds of shoots. I went on the road with Adi um, in an RV um, along with several people at our company, uh, People's TV, um, the producer, the editor, um, and um, a, a kind of rotating cast of DPs. Um, and that was that was an interesting production environment. I'd never really like done a road shoot before and we were trying to edit on the road, which was a disaster um, uh, and get to keep power. And, you know, we have a lot of war stories from that um, RV trip um, and just keeping up with Adi and making this film in that context was crazy. And then ultimately we had more kind of um, traditional shoots, long form sit down interviews, right? Or we would schedule and have a full crew and a shoot list, et cetera. And 
but there were so many um, things that would just happen spontaneously where we had to get a videographer out like immediately. And I say videographer because like we had DPs, but sometimes Adi would like get sick and need to, um, we need to be there right away. Or he'd be like, I'm going to DC and you guys need to be there with me. Um, so it was like a mix. There was some, there's a lot of stuff we shot on iPhones because we couldn't get into mm -hmm. the room with the, with the person. So it was a really like mixed media approach. A lot of the best stuff in the movie was shot by activists who we collected their footage. Um, it was a crazy archival process to find the old stuff of him. Um, and uh, yeah, I think that um, my takeaway from this project in terms of how I would, like how we made this thing was like a real collage tapestry of different people, different cameras, which allowed us to be in the room when we needed to be. And I think the reason the film really works and has like a really driving narrative verite quality is because I had a good sense of when things were gonna go down and I would get somebody in the room um, with him. And I you know, was able to work with Adi closely to make sure we were there. And that's why it's like mm -hmm. cameras there when the doctor's appointments happen and there at the Kavanaugh protests. And I wasn't always able to go um, as a director. There was a lot of, um, uh, times where DPs were shooting solo um, and getting, getting remote instructions and interview questions, et cetera. Um, and that's probably because I'm in New York mm -hmm. and LA. There were also real variety of times where I lived at Adi's house for like a week in his garage. And that way I could just come in and film him and his wife having dinner or whatever. But um, it was a lot of shooting to get that kind of intimacy that I think you see in the film. Mm -hmm. um, we often talk to filmmakers about leading sustainable lives um, making money from their art. <laughs> and um, you already kind of alluded to your commercial production company. Um, and I know that you do a lot in terms of your work. Uh, can you talk a little bit about uh, diversifying while making this project? I mean, I know that you didn't start out with the feature. You mentioned that. And there are some shorter form projects on your website. So I assume that those kind of short form working with Adi became um, a pattern of work together mm -hmm. um yeah but anyway could you talk a little bit about um uh, maintaining a living while making this film yeah definitely i um in my every i think every artist and every medium has their own version of doing this um certainly um even though uh, this film i think you know had a small salary for myself but not a sustainable one um and unless the film uh, does truly gangbusters box office, which, you know, we all hope for, and we'll see what happens, um, you know, would not be on its own a sustainable livelihood, um, even with the success it's had, certainly not divided over three years. Um, and I think most doc filmmakers know, know the deal there. And um, in my iteration of making that work, that balance work, is that um, at People's TV, we kind of have a documentary arm and a commercial arm. Um, and so even throughout this process, um, about half my time is dedicated to um, doing branded work. And the, mm -hmm. that branded work started including Via Hero, which gave me this amazing, amazing story to have access to. But um, it also spans a whole number of other racial and social justice causes. Um, we do work for Black Lives Matter and for Greenpeace and for the Nature Conservancy and um, sort of every the UN and every like kind of uh, brand and, and nonprofit that's doing social justice storytelling. And that's worked well for me because it's allowed me to kind of keep my chops sharp, making stuff frequently. Um, I have an amazing team that um, worked on the film, um, that work at my company, including um, the, uh, Amanda, the producer, Astro, the associate producer, the, um, you know, down to the bookkeeper or legal was the company legal. So having that infrastructure really helped me. Of course, it's a trade-off, right? I would love to, as I'm sure, Many, many others would love to only do art and not have not to be at the mercy of anybody um, uh, engaging their like creativity for for hire. But from my perspective, I don't I don't consider doing the commercial work like bread and butter. It's really like a part of who I am, and I think the value of my storytelling brings to the world. And I'm not. It's not like to pay the bills. It's because I um, really think that brands and nonprofits need better storytelling and. Um, need the kind of like Sundance and indie spirit um, brought to them so that they're not making, you know, crappy fundraising videos, but are doing things that really engage people around the work they're doing in the field. You know, those are, those are activists like Adi that are clients um, for us. So I don't, I don't, um, 
you know, I'm very proud of that work that we do and, and that made it sustainable um, and continues to make it sustainable for us to do films. But, um, you know, it's a lot and it's not for everybody, you know, and I think some for, for some folks, um, you know, very good friends of mine who, who want, to, want to direct features, they're, um, they counterbalance that with, um, with teaching. And that's a really great outlet as well to share your expression while making it work. And of course, if you are in that 1% of the 1%, then you get that, you know, Marvel movie or whatever, uh, you know, Hollywood comes calling and you get, you get those big paychecks for films. With the kinds of movies I make, I think it's really important to have a sort of variety of uh, income streams or just to have a really strong craft, you know, like be a great editor so that in between your jobs, you know, and it's, I'm not the only one, right? Like Spike Jones and Spike Lee are, are both shooting commercials in between their movies. So um, I think it's kind of like a well-established um, tradition if you want to be a kind of outsider storyteller. Um, I have a rather nerdy distribution question to ask as my main question. So you tell me if this is like so unappealing to answer. Yeah. Um, so Greenwich is doing theatrical and uh, you got POV for your broadcast deal. You already retained SVOD rights mm -hmm. um, or subscription VOD for things like Hulu or Netflix deal. Yep. Um, is, is that by design? And how will impact um, intervene and work alongside all of these things that you're doing? Yeah, um, all good questions. Um, no, we are um, retaining the streaming rights because PBS has an exclusive streaming window in January. And so after that, we're going to um, work with another SVOD partner so that it can be seen more widely. Um, and to your question about impact, we are, that's super important to me for obvious reasons. This whole film is like a tour of going from local community to community and like holding events to rally people around the cause of healthcare and, and democracy. And so it kind of was an outreach campaign. And so um, we have an impact consultant helping us organize screenings, Audi's organization, Be a Hero, um, and uh, CPD, the Center for Popular Democracy. These are both kind of national activist organizations that lead the kind of bird dog trainings that you see in the film where they teach activists how to activate, um, which I found really, really fascinating. Um, and this is all to say that it's like a core and central part of our strategy. We're working closely with Greenwich to um, actually make those, um, you know, combine the, bring the orgs to the theatrical, doing separate screenings. Um, we're working with Seed and Spark on something I'm really excited about, you might be familiar with, called Film Forward, where we do corporate screenings with advocacy groups within corporations which I find really exciting because those are some of the institutions, especially around healthcare that are um, holding back progress. And so the idea of being able to kind of show it within the belly of the beast is really great. Um, and we are looking for more partners to screen with. So if you, you know, are watching this and want to show Not Going Quietly at a community near you, definitely reach out to us at notgoingquietlyfilm.com. Yay. Um, I'm on to my final five questions. Then these are like kind of the more personal ones. Um, so what's the first film you ever made and how do you feel about it now? Uh, the first feature doc I made was called, and really I would say the first kind of, yeah, to best answer to this question is a, a documentary called La Americana. And it actually has a lot of narrative overlap with um, Not Going Quietly because it tells the story of a um, undocumented immigrant who comes to the US from Bolivia because her daughter is hit by a car and is left in a wheelchair paralyzed from the waist down. And so she comes to America to pay her daughter's medical bills, but is separated from her daughter um, for many years until she finally decides that money isn't the only thing and she's got to go home no matter what. And so that film documents her life, her daughter's life, and then their final reuniting across borders. And so it's kind of about the intersection of, there's a big, big theme in it about the intersection of immigration and disability in healthcare. Um, even though it's a very personal mother-daughter story mm -hmm. and not going quietly as a father-son story um, at, at a similar crossroads. So um, it's, uh, you know, certainly thematically connected. And, um, you know, I was like 23 when I made the movie and it didn't have the kind of like indie success that I wanted it to at the time in the sense that like it most, it did really well at, at festivals and it played at but, you know, a lot of Latino film festivals and things where I, you know, wanted to have that Sundance glory um, or, or which didn't happen in my career until much later. 
Um, and I did end up having watch having to watch it, rewatch it again about a year ago, 10 years or so later. And um, I thought it held up. I thought it was too long and that I was too kind of self-indulgent about how, you know, the, the director's gaze or whatever. Um, and in, in retrospect, probably would have shaved another 10 minutes off it. Um, but I thought sort of at the heart of it, I was still really, really proud of it, despite it being in, you know, SD, a shot it on mini DV tapes. So it, it looks and it looks like it. Um, but um, yeah, it was interesting to see the kind of very clear through line um, between that film and my current one. And um, it was also, it's also still very relevant, you know, it's sort of same issues. And I think for better or for worse, I hope not going quietly sort of stands the same test of time. Um, and yeah, La Americana did have, you know, it got onto like Nat Geo and PBS and, and sort of had a, like had a distribution life, which was great for me at the time. But I also, it was very much a precursor to a lot of the conversations we're having now about sustainability because it was a wake up call for me that even with sales agent making deals and all that, just with the costs of making a feature, um, I needed supplementary source of income. And that's how I began freelancing and later on began forming my company. The same kind of thing happened on Valley of Saints, which was a feature film that I produced with director Musa Saeed, which won the audience award at Sundance and got a lot of critical acclaim, um, but was of course always a struggle from a financial standpoint. And so those experiences I think were very creatively satisfying and I'm very proud of the films, um, but set the stage for me to understand, for me anyway, this dynamic of um, telling stories um, for, for others in addition to telling my own. Um, do you have a goal as a filmmaker, like something specific that you want to hit? Oh, cool. That I want to hit like, um, well, um, you know, a lot of the screenings that we've had, some have been really packed and some have been, um, pretty quiet because of COVID, um, as festivals and theaters start to open up. So, um, you know, there's been one or two screenings that we've done, which have been, you know, pretty quiet in terms of the audience size. And I, Sometimes folks will say at the festival, I'm sorry, we didn't have more people come out. We have this mask mandate or whatever. And I kind of shrug that off and say that, you know, if you reach one person and have a really strong impact on them and their lives, that that's kind of all you can ask for as an artist. So I think that's really the the goal. And if that's too cliche, then I yeah want to, um, you know, I don't know, win an Oscar and <laughs> uh, make millions of dollars. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, I think that, um, you know, the former is, is satisfying me for now, but I, yeah, I hope that more people get to see the, um, work I'm doing and I'm really interested in, you know, uplifting and supporting, um, other diverse storytellers I, I produce as well as direct and, um, um, am interested in, um, great stories being brought to people's TV that we can produce. We're working on a narrative feature right now that I'll be producing, which I'm excited about. Um, and so I'm, yeah, I want to, I want to, um, tell great stories and also amplify um, unheard voices. Mm. Um, you've already, I mean, I know you've already accomplished that goal. I just want to tell you that, uh, that I, as soon as I got the email about this movie, I was like, I want to talk to him. <laughs> like, um, and there are scenes, cause I saw an earlier cut of the film. So I don't know if they still exist in this final cut, but there are scenes of the cut that I saw that I, I don't think I'll ever forget. And I can't tell you why. Um, so just letting you know, the goal is already accomplished. You already know that though. I'm sure you've heard that from like 30,000 people. Um, if you could go back in time, what's the one piece of advice you would give yourself? Yeah, I think that what I've learned and maybe this, I'm trying to think if anybody told me this specifically or where, um, where I got this from, but I think that it's really important to like think about as you're filming and in any stage of production to really think about your audience and um, think about not just what's happening in front of you. I think a lot of people think about kind of access and trust and when to move forward and when to push and when to fight. And I think that as filmmakers, like, and as a documentary filmmaker, you've got to really fight like for your audience. And that can be to get into that room to shoot that scene, or that can be to, um, you know, push for that interview or, um, um, and it's very, it's very, um, I think easy in, in doc filmmaking to relent and sort of 
acquiesce to the various forces that are pushing back on you, whether financial or, or access wise or whatever. Um, and that can also be about sticking to your guns creatively. And so that's, that's something that's really important to me. Um, and the other thing I think just in terms of advice, and this has been like a really long journey for me that I haven't solved yet is just that, um, you know, I mentioned a lot of folks that worked on this film with me and I'm glad to be, um, you know, spreading the, the word about this movie, but, um, I am a big believer in kind of long-term and consistent collaborations. And I think that um, like finding your people that you work well with and understand your the division and, and gel with creatively and um, understand how hard you wanna work and are, are ready to work, roll up their sleeves alongside you um, where you don't feel like you're, they under, that you're gonna push hard and then accept that or will push you hard back because they believe in, in what you're making. Like those are just the absolutely 100% most valuable relationships and trying to bring those people from project to project and, um, you know, honoring them and treating them well um, in order to retain that partnership is, is really important. But I think that's like the number one thing I would say to young me is to cultivate those relationships, you know, many of which I'm still developing now. And I think that's like a lifelong thing. Um, but that's and developing that kind of cinematic shorthand with people um sometimes that takes years or many films to do um so i'm very grateful to have those people in my life and always looking for more collaborators to keep keep working with last question um is making movies hard <laughs> compared to uh just in general you could compare it to rocket scientists rank rocket science you could compare it to sitting on your couch whenever you want yeah that's definitely harder than sitting on your couch um mm -hmm. Yeah, I honestly think what, what it comes down to really, so yes, making movies is hard, but the reason that making movies is hard is because it's an incredibly privileged job to have. And I think this may go back to the days of the um, village where there was a coveted position to be the storyteller by the campfire. Um, and you know, I'm an anthropologist, but I think this is a very time-honored tradition that the arts um, are and and this and the storytelling profession is a very um, fulfilling and rewarding and compelling and recognized um, position to be in in society, and that makes it incredibly competitive to succeed in. Um, and the same may be true of I don't know athletics or other fields, um, but I think you know recognizing and being grateful for lack of a you know better cliche and, and sort of having a gratitude practice around your ability to tell stories at all might kind of mitigate or put into context with how hard it is. Like, of course it's hard. Your job is to like discover things and share them. You know what I mean? How lucky, how lucky is that? So um, it's super hard, but the reason it's hard is because of how, how wonderful it is. And, and you have to really fight hard. Like I was saying before, for your audience, for your collaborators, in order to cut out of the pack and, and make it sustainable and sometimes do other work, you know, um, like like we talked about as well. Um, so it's it's hard, but it's worth it. Lovely. All right, well, send people where they wanna go. So tell us, remind us of your website, remind us how people could sign up for screenings, everything you wanna share. Yeah, so the website is notgoingquietlyfilm.com um, and you can buy tickets for the upcoming theatrical release and we'll have all the news on digital. It's also on social um, at Not Going Quietly Film. And uh, I'm also on Twitter at Nick underscore Bruckman and on Instagram at Nicholas Bruckman. And always happy to chat with filmmakers and talk about how hard making movies is. Go ahead, ask me. <laughs> ask me the question you're dying to know. Yeah, what do you remember from your talk with Nicholas? <laughs> I actually, I was sad I couldn't make this. I just, it was a scheduling thing. Um, but yeah, I will listen. So tell me, what was so great? I um, had been aware of this movie for years. When I was at my last job, I saw a rough cut of it. I like was desperate to work on it in terms of like an impact campaign. They went another way. Then I left my job and I kept hearing about this movie, Not Going Quietly. Um, and it, for those who don't know about it, I mean, I haven't seen the newest cut, but I think I sobbed through the entire movie <laughs> because this young man, it's called not going quietly because he's using every aspect of him um, in the fight for healthcare activism 
even though he can't talk and he has ALS, he's rendered, you know, partially immobile through the ALS. Um, he has two children, but you get to know him and he just has like the best attitude. Um, anyway, I just think it's like one of those eye opening movies and I just was desperate to talk to Nick about it. And that's why I took it solo. And that's why it's just the Liz show. And that's what I remember about it. That's the answer to your question, Alric. Nice. That's what I remember. I love it. Um, yeah. Well, I can't wait to, wait to listen. And, uh, you know, I think we're going to do something different. We're going to do a soap dish. I'm Lori Craven, and I'm an actress. <laughs> an actress? Really? How nice for you. I'm Betsy Faye Sharon, and I'm a bitch. Uh, over the last weekend, the Constellation Incubator that Liz is a co-founder of had their presentation day, and I was set to watch. I even logged in. I was looking at Naomi talk and Liz talk, but then I got called away on baby duty, so and I couldn't make it back. Um, but I know I can watch it on YouTube, so I will. Uh, but Liz, tell us, what were some of the big takeaways from this event? So if you've been listening to the show for the past few months, uh, we formed an incubator to try to solve the problems, the inherent problems of, of indie film uh, development, production, and distribution. So we got together 60 filmmakers uh, and we divided them up into teams of four to six and we had them each design their own independent film ecosystem that they wanted to see out into the world. And they presented all 12 of those ecosystems this past Sunday. And yes, um, all, all presentations are recorded and on YouTube. And I would say the big takeaways from my perspective are a lot of filmmakers want to work in collectives or pods. A lot of filmmakers want to be paid. A lot of filmmakers <laughs> want to be treated better. Uh, a lot of filmmakers want to connect directly with audiences or with financiers. I mean, there's, there seems to be this recognition of the barriers in between us and uh, gatekeepers and uh, things that quote unquote move the needle. So a lot of this was about direct development, direct distribution, direct filmmaking. And um, there's a hell of a lot of enthusiasm from people to do things outside of the Hollywood system. So we're trying to encourage people to watch the presentations. And then what we're doing is we're forming what we call a knowledge database. So everyone who tries these ecosystems or tries their own ideas that are outside of the Hollywood infrastructure uh, can report back to us and we're going to be a repository of all experiences that people have in testing out different ecosystems. Was, was, was there anyone yes. who like came up with a solution for like how to, to get connected to financiers or how to work with financiers or was that not part of it? Um, you know, it was addressed. So part of the ecosystem Part of the incubator itself was to do these things called empathy interviews where we interviewed people in financing um, financing people who are filmmakers and people who are audience members and we asked them like question core questions that got to the center of why they did what they did and a lot of film teams uh, found out that f investors are actually not risk averse they may be investing for the risk and there's kind of a thrill like atmosphere to it or they may doing it to maybe doing it to elevate a cause or um, a film with a mission, and so there were a lot of impact related s strategies that were put forth, and then also ecosystems that involved the investors throughout the entire process. They developed like way more intimate connections as a community, mm. and that could reap benefits for everyone. Um, so not one solution, no, but people are thinking. How do we stop thinking of it as like an us versus them scenario and how do we incorporate each other more? Yeah. Yeah, it's interesting. I felt like with like my experience with investors, it was like you either talk to somebody who like invests in movies and then it's like, Well, why should I invest in your movie when there's like way many other movies with you know, filmmakers who have way more experience that I could invest in, you know, and you don't have anything like Sundance attached to your film or you know, whatever, any of these different, um, you know, associations or anything. It's like, you know, they gravitate towards those kinds of projects. Like, you know, like he tried to invest in Sorry to Bother You, or no, not Sorry to Bother You, um, the other one, uh, Last Black Man in San Francisco, and they, then he couldn't get in on it. Like he had, I think it was even a case where he had invested, and then they made this deal with um, Plan B, and then they had to give the, the money back to a bunch of investors in order to work with Plan B. And it was like this, oh, like... Wow. 
you know, just this thing that happened. And so, you know, it was, it was like that, that kind of person or like, you know, the people I like people I get I meet who I either work with or collaborate with or just meet in life and who are like not at all you know film make film investors the dentists of the world yeah but who like invest their money in things and but they would yeah. but they're investing them in because they know it's like oh this is gonna like you know get me money later or it's a safe investment and like anything that's not a safe investment is like scrutinized like heavily and like you know and like I got a lot of those kinds of conversations and a lot of times you can't convince people that it doesn't matter if you're not going to get a return on your investment it's going to be fun but then some people are just like yeah it is going to be fun I'm in or like I love you all like you're so great I believe in your filmmaking like I'll give you x amount of dollars you know like that's usually the way that it would work you know when it when someone right. says yes it's like it's just because they believe in me you know, and and the film, but mostly me. Some of them even really care it's about the movie. <laughs> it's not the movie. It is you. It's the personality. Right. It's your relationship. We talk about that a little bit in the opening remarks of the incubator. In that, the films that um, that people invest into currently are so entrenched in the system. Like the ones that make money, make money because they are entrenched in the system. They are repped by agencies. They're uh, populated with actors who are on the slates of those agencies. It's, you know, they play festivals that have lobbyists from those agencies. You know, it's all kind of this one little like uh, cuddle party in, in of nepotism. <laughs> um, so I, I reckon, but ultimately you can never promise potential recoupment there's no way you could ever guarantee that and i think what people do some investors uh, invest because of prestige or luxury or fun or inclusivity into the hollywood machinations mm -hmm. and yeah that's the type of investor i never go after right because i can't promise them just like you i can't be like well we're definitely gonna play tell you ride no problem <laughs> No, but, but you can those, promise like that you will play some film festivals, you know, and that they'll be invited, say, like, you know. Yeah, I think I'm more interested in the type of investor who's interested in new models, mm. who wants to um, work directly with audiences, who um, like, you know, some of one of the ideas that came up uh, that the incubator came up with was like immersive storytelling. Like what if you watched a film about an underwater world underwater uh -huh. you know it's like can you be atypical in the way you exhibit your work? Huh. and that's the type of investor i want to look into interesting um so if like someone doesn't have time to watch every one of these presentations like which is the top one that you would like say oh, okay watch this one first no no you can't I mean, do it I it's not fair um, okay, fine. I could say, why don't you just go on YouTube and check out the view count and then just look <laughs> that has the highest view count, and you could do that. Or be like, no, like people just don't understand. Like I'll pick the one with the lowest view count, and like that's gonna be the one where all the gems are that no one gets to see because no one's watching them. Well, I will shout <laughs> out. There's a great project called, I think it's called the Hive. Um, it may be called Beehive. No, so I think it's called the. I think it's called the Hive because I I looked at them all yesterday. Okay, well, there's also one called Beehive. Um, but this one has um, a lot of emphasis on ARG, aud um, mm. uh, um, augmented reality games. Mm -hmm. And there's a game within the presentation that you could participate oh, in. Oh, weird. And I think that's very cool. Um, and then there's one called Cinelove that's kind of like... Um, a dating app for film investors, yeah. which I think is uh, pretty cool, cool too. So there's a lot of cool stuff that um, that we're gonna share. So yeah, just search Constellation Incubator on YouTube, and you'll find our channel. This this reminds me of when I used to shoot, um, you know, for like uh, Silicon Valley like uh, startups. You know, like they they would have yes. like I worked yes. for an incubator for those kind of things, and they had their investor day where they would present all their ideas. So this just to me feels just like that. <laughs> You know, that's exactly but it. for film, that's exact, oh. which is great. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, cool. Last words. Anything else you want to say about Constellation In Incubator, Liz? Like what's what's the plans for the future? Uh, I, all I can say is watch this space. I can't tell you what the plans are. We're still deciding. We're trying to figure out what the right pathway to go is. But um, a lot of people from the incubator want to take action on their ideas. And they were all chosen because they have a film that they're going to produce in the next few years. Oh, cool. So um, I'd say watch this space. And um, more importantly, Ulrich, 
You've got mail. <laughs> my breath catches in my chest as I hear three little words. You've got mail. So uh, we have yet another email. Uh, we've been getting a lot uh, lately. And, you know, Jeanette Bloom, she sent us like three emails. There's no questions in her emails, but there's like these great little conversation bits but, that I want to get to. But, you know, we've got to go with the questions first. So we got one uh, yesterday from Abraham A.A. Mikiel, and he has a question, but he writes, Hi, Liz and all. Wait, is it Abraham or a- Abram? Abram. Yeah, probably Abram. Okay. Sorry, Ab- Abram. I don't know why Abraham is what I see when I see Abram. <laughs> Terrible. Well, because you know exactly why. Because <laughs> you just put an H in yeah. there. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> don't play dumb, Ulrich. Um, <laughs> so Abram writes, Hi, Liz and Ulrich. I recently started listening to your podcast, and I want to reach out and thank you for creating such cool and meaningful content. I'm a filmmaker based in SoCal, an immigrant, a film school grad, my thesis film, Desert Foreigners, played in a couple of film festivals, Beverly Hills Film Festival and Oaxaca Film Fest. I heard Oaxaca's good. Is that true? Is it good? I've heard Oaxaca's pretty decent. Um, I'm currently in the process of jumpstarting my first narrative feature. Would love to connect with you guys. And then I was like, okay, Abram, like, you know, do you have a question or anything? Thank you for the nice things, but like, what do you got? Because we're going to read this on the show no matter what, but let's get something good out of it. And then he says... Thank you uh, for the prompt response. My biggest struggle as a filmmaker is giving me is me gravitating towards wanting to make drama features without much access to name actors or a decent budget. Oftentimes I hear that making a genre film is better for first time filmmakers for a number of reasons. I'm really interested in hearing your thoughts on a first time filmmaker attempting to make a no budget feature film without notable name actors and what possible avenues a film like this can take to find success, aside from the highly unlikely <laughs> of getting into Sundance, etc. And he does a smiling, <laughs> crying smiley face. Thank you for all that you guys do. Um, so what do you think, Liz? Um, make the drama with no cast for the lowest budget you can as the way to make your first feature and then put resources into the film that you think could be more of a commercial success. Um, I... Look, I'm switching to genre because drama, even dramedies are not interesting enough for the marketplace. <laughs> and genre to me is really exciting and I want to be there, but it is a very strategic move on my part to find people where, to find a situation where I can find more easily find investors um, and hopefully more platforms, more eyeballs and a bigger chance of return. So I would say make the film that's in your heart, but... Uh, unless you have a genre script ready, uh, go for that drama, cast people you love, make it in the, with resources you have, get that first feature, that exercise out of the way, learn what you, you know, and I don't mean to say that as like, just knock it off your list, but get your learning lessons done and then work on trying to make a life out of filmmaking after that. What do you think they should spend on this drama that's just like a throwaway drama to get it out of their system? Less than $30,000. Yeah. I think that's really great advice because we've seen so many filmmakers on our show who've made movies, uh, drama films, for 30000 or under. Um, and, you know, yeah, I think that's just like a really great way to – you know, exercise that demon if you have to. But, you know, I, we've had a filmmaker on the show, um, Sean Lynch, who I think said on the show, like, you know, I wish I hadn't made my drama as my first feature uh, because I made it and nothing happened. And then, like, you know, whatever, five, six, eight years later, now he makes his, his first horror feature. And, like, you know, it seems like it's already doing way better <laughs> than, than right, his drama feature. Did he did. get that second feature? Like, how important was that first feature in getting to the people? Not, like, not at all important. We talked about this. Well, say, telling someone that you've made a feature and that you've helmed a larger project. Well, I, you don't have to tell them what the budget is. I'm pretty sure that he self funded Well, he, I think he self funded both. Um, oh, well, then and, yeah. And, and, and one was he went to crowdfunding for the for the second one, 
But I think he probably would have gotten that money um, even if he hadn't made the first feature, most likely. Mm. Um, maybe not, but I, I kind of think so. And the, the thing that kills me about about that, and you know, he'll, he'll admit the same thing, is just like, you know, he's a genre guy at heart. He loves horror movies. He grew up with horror movies, and then he made the, the, the drama movie because he thought that's like what you would do to like start a prestigious career as a filmmaker is to make the drama. And it's also just what he wanted to make at the time really badly. It's like what was important to him. Um, and yeah. you know, but he'd already written horror scripts, <laughs> and so, and that's actually how he raised the money for his movie. He like won a contest for like forty thousand dollars, and then like writing a horror film, and then he used that to make the indie drama. <laughs> but anyways, oh. very interesting. Um, but you know, I, I, what, what, basically, what I'm trying to say, um, Abram, is make the genre film. If you like genre, if you don't like genre, then maybe not. But like, if you even have anything that's interesting to you in the genre space and that you want to do i would just do that why waste time making something that's not going to further your career unless like you have this burning desire and that's the only thing you want to make then i guess do it but i think what liz said is true like don't spend more than thirty thousand dollars on it you know well can we play out the scenario of the drama though because i think it's worthwhile i i as a distribution consultant Every now and then I have someone coming to me who has no sense of how the marketplace works at all. So you make a drama film with no name cast. Most likely, unless somehow you get millions of dollars and this really looks like an expensive, well-told film, you have a really fantastic script, whatever it is, most likely the best festival you're going to get into is a mid-tier regional festival no knock off of you know this not knocking those but they actually have curation and they're not 100 percent reliant on celebrities for ticket sales so there is there are people actually watching your content there but that being said that mid-tier genre festival is not going to open the doorways to a distributor or a marketing budget or anything you need to make a splash and you need those things in order to bring back revenue into your LLC to make the next film. So that's a very, very, very thin summary of what happens if you make a drama with no cast. So you, if you choose to make the drama, you do so knowing that nothing is going to happen, nothing meaningful. But, but if you feel like you can't make the genre film without a little practice first, that's why I'm saying mm. go for it, right? Mm -hmm. I do 100% agree if you're, you know, you're gonna have a little bit more of an ease to your process with genre. But I mean, I don't regret making a rom-com as my first film. And it, it exactly did that trajectory. It played mid-tier festivals and we got revenue, but it's not, you know, it's not, it didn't change my world. And the thing that's really ultra, it's not, I don't want to sound too negative, Liz, but that's like a really teachable learning moment for people is that you did have name cast in your movie. You yeah. didn't have like A-listers, but like Bobby Moynihan, everybody knows who that is, you know, at least who watches TV. Um, and then, you know, Lauren Lapkus, anyone who's in comedy or likes comedy knows who that is. And they were both in your first movie. And like you still had trouble, yeah. which is like to me like crazy. <laughs> you know, you and we we did probably we're probably recouping right now. And by the way, Alex Ferrari's podcast, um, I did his podcast about my first film, and it's like every week it retweets an episode I did like years ago <laughs> that makes it seem like I'm like a gazillionaire or something, and I'm not. Um, <laughs> the fact that we are close to recouping, if not have already are recouped, is incredibly rare. Like, we right. are actually a success, but to no one other than me knowing the perspective about distribution that I do. So I can't go to, like, um, XYZ and be like, well, my first film, we recouped. Give me all your money. You know, it means nothing in the larger scheme of things. But, well, but why doesn't but that mean something? Why can't you just say, like, I recouped on, on my first feature? Like, that's pretty great, right? Because my brand is still micro budget filmmaker who like I'm not an in demand it's kind of like beggars who can't be chooser if I have to like <laughs> if I have to explain for 20 minutes about how I'm an anomaly I am to a sales agent or a financier like that's not a it should be evidence 
um, and it should be based off of the pitch. I'm just saying, like, I'm an anomaly in the marketplace, but no one knows because no one knows that no one makes any money off of distribution. Right. Well, and what you should plan for is making no money. Yeah, but I feel like still, like, in a meeting with somebody, even especially an investor, to say that you recouped on your first feature is like. That's a good thing to say. <laughs> you should definitely be bragging. I do. About that. I always say like I was on Hulu. I always say I had these airline deals. Like I always say these things, but um, but ultimately, in terms of being like an on, an in demand commodity, right? There are tears. Right? right. Yeah. I'm not. I'm not. No. I'm not in it. But tier. a lot of people like getting to the in demand commodity thing. Like, how many people get to that? Like, you know, it's not. I think like. If you're going to play the game of, of uh, you know, what indie filmmaking and trying to raise money for your film, it's like using those those stats are val- valuable. You know, that's a really good piece of information. Use whatever you have. Yeah. Well, use whatever you have. But I'm saying in the great and I agree, use whatever you have. But looking at it from the hundred foot view, it's meaningless. And what ultimately you should be doing is if you don't have a lot of resources at your disposal, do not spend a lot of resources when you make your movie. Yeah. And lead and just like you were saying, if it's itching at you every day that you have to make that drama, make the drama. Do not go into debt. And if you can wait, I do agree. Put put resources behind a genre. And I, and I will say, just uh, to, to be, be completely honest, the first thing that my producer, Jeff, uh, said to me when we finished uh, the alternate, he was like, yeah, great job. It really, really came together well. I think you did a really nice job. Um, your life is not going to change when this movie comes out. <laughs> You're going to have to do this all over again the exact same way the next time, unless you like hit win the lottery, basically. you know. And so... like. Even genre or no genre, you're 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 probably in the same boat, <laughs> you know. Right? Yeah. Even if it's ch- great point, of course. Yeah. The, even if you do a genre film, it's not going to matter at all. Yeah. I mean, but you just have a little bit more of an edge, like when you have no cast, because you have like this thing that people want to see, regardless of uh, who's in it, you know. And then, like, it just gives you a little bit of a better chance of getting into festivals, a little bit of a better chance of getting a good distribution deal, a little bit of a better chance of someone caring later when you're trying to make your next movie, you know? Um, it's just a little more edge. Um, but it's definitely not any, like, you know, ace in the hole or anything. <laughs> yeah, when I do sales, I haven't taken on any dramas, but just because none have come. I have one drama. I have one drama I'm doing sales on, and it's black and white. And it's playing dances with films. And I love it. I love it. <laughs> and I have to say over and over again, please, please watch it. Honestly, it's worth your time. Like, I always, it's almost like, because <laughs> people come at me, and they'll be like, it's a drama. And I'm like, no, 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 no. It's so much more than a drama. You know, there is that bias that I'm hitting as someone who does sales. That's so funny. Um, well, Abraham, I hope this was helpful. Um, and uh, Liz, I think we've got a new iTunes review. You want to give us a read? We do. We do. We got a five-star review from the UK. And this username is Castellan66, which I feel like I'm mispronouncing. Castellan66. Okay. <laughs> a feast a week. Wonderfully engaging and honest exploration of the challenges of filmmaking and the experiences of those surmounting them. Uh, for those new to this world, a crash course in its culture, mindsets, and folk ways, replete with thought-provoking advice and practical wisdom from outstanding and generous guests. A great encouragement, too, to those starting out on this journey. Always a highlight of my week when a new episode drops. Um, I think we need to copy and paste this and replace whatever descriptions we have on the internet with what this fabulous person wrote. Yeah. Thank you. Castellan, Castellan, yeah. Castellan. This was a really amazing review, and I couldn't wait to read it on the show. It's so awesome. So thank you so much for all the kind words. <laughs> um, and lastly, we have a brand new Patreon patron. Thanks to Kyle freaking Kenyon, who's been mentioned on the show multiple times. We had talked about his short film Dad Pals uh, Moons and Moons Dad Ago, Pals. which Liz loves. Um, but yeah, thanks for putting your money where your mouth is. We really appreciate it. You're the best. Um, and Liz, take us out. <laughs> if you want to be like Abram, you can send us some question, comment, or suggestion to podcast at makingmoviesishard.com. If you like the show, you can leave us a review on iTunes, like Castellian, Castellian, Castellian did. Castellian 6-6, forgot the number. Okay. 
You can also go to our YouTube page. We're at two, we're 240 plus, around close to 250 subscribers. You can leave a comment <laughs> or question. Um, and lastly, you can support the show on Patreon, just like Kyle freaking Canyon did. Uh, www.patreon.com slash MMIH podcast. Give whatever you can. It's really meaningful. It does not go into our pockets. It goes into our editor's pockets and actually does not fill their pockets. So we are still in debt every single show. But we're going to keep doing it because we love doing it. Finally, check us out on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter at MMIH Podcast and YouTube at Making Movies is Hard Podcast. And thanks, everyone, for listening. Thanks to Nicholas Bruckman for coming on the show. And thanks to Erica Abrams from Falco, Inc. for setting up the interview. You can check out our website at MakingMoviesIsHard.com. Um, it will be updated at some point. It will happen. Um, and uh, thanks to editor Cameron for doing the editing. And talk to you guys next week. I'm a bitch. <laughs> I'm a bitch. <laughs> so over the is last... Is that what she said? I think it is. I'm, I'm yeah. something, something sh- Sharon, something McFerrin. I can't remember her name. Uh, <laughs> and I'm a bitch. <laughs>